Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the University of Chicago, Francis and Rose Yuen campus here in Hong Kong for our third global conversation, live online event, 100 Year Lives in Asia with Professor Kate Cagney. My name is Mark Barnico, and I'm the executive director of the University of Chicago, Francis and Rose Yuen campus here in Hong Kong. The Yuen campus in Hong Kong is the premier location in Asia, which represents the University of Chicago's values of free and open discourse, rigorous debate, and an exchange of ideas. The 100 Year Lives in Asia series is one of the new programs developed under the UN Lecture Series banner by the U Chicago Hong Kong team and Professor Kate Cagney. Tonight, we're again delighted to welcome UN scholar Professor Kate Cagney from the University of Chicago Sociology Department to host the third of seven episodes of our program, 100 Year Lives in Asia. Tonight's conversation topic uh, is social distancing and historical perspective. The 100 Year Lives in Asia program will discuss more than aging and the elderly. The program was created for us to rethink the arc of a single human life. Throughout human history, global populations have faced widespread disease, plagues, and pandemics. Tonight, we will focus on the history of uh, epidemics and social distancing. We'll also try to get at the underlying differences between Western and Asian societies, cultures, and family structures to see what we can learn from one another. Several episodes of this new series are focused on our new reality with COVID-19 and will continue to be broadcast every two weeks. Our fourth and next episode on June 11th is entitled Intergenerational Transfer of Wealth. Please plan to join us for the next online event. Now I'd like to get to the program and introduce the chair of 100 Year Lives in Asia, Kate Cagney. Professor Cagney is a professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago and the director of the Population Research Center, NORC, and the University of Chicago. Good morning, Kate. Good morning, Mark, and thank you. My pleasure. We'll, we'll get started now, and I'll turn the remainder of the program over to you. Thanks so much. We do, of course, find ourselves on this webinar due to recommendations related to sheltering in place and social distancing. So how did we get here? How is it that just yesterday, the US has passed the mark of 100,000 deaths, even with such recommendations in place? Well, I must say we rely on historians to bring insight, to help us understand trajectories and turning points in the import of political systems and social norms. And that's who we have turned to today. Let me tell you about, about the two leading scholars who will guide our thinking. Christopher Kindle, received his PhD in history from the University of Chicago in 2019 and is currently a postdoctoral teaching fellow in the Department of History in the college. His research focuses on the history of infectious diseases, urban public health programs, and the Pacific world. He also looks at the effects of global trade networks in the long 19th century United States. His current book manuscript, The Sanitary Sieve, Public Health, Mobility, and the Making of the Urban Pacific World 1850 to 1920, examines how public health officials, Native Hawaiians, and East Asian immigrants transformed Honolulu from a placid mid-Pacific harbor into a vital disease screening checkpoint for the Hawaiian Islands, the Pacific Basin, and America's growing overseas empire. Topher teaches courses on the history of medicine, race, and colonialism through various interdisciplinary settings, including the Department of History, the Global Studies Program, and the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture at the University of Chicago. Our other speaker is Howard Markle, MD, PhD. He is the George Wants, MD, Distinguished Professor, the History of Medicine, and Director of the Center for the History of Medicine at the University of Michigan. He's also Professor of Pediatrics, Psychiatry, Public Health Management and Policy, History, and English Language and Literature. Trained at the University of Michigan and Johns Hopkins, Markle is one of the preeminent social and cultural historians of medicine, public health, and epidemics across the globe. Dr. Markle is the author, co-author, or co-editor of 11 books, including Quarantine, East European Jewish Immigrants and the New York City Epidemics of 1892, and When Germs Travel, Six Major Epidemics That Have Invaded America Since 1900 and the Fears They Have Unleashed. From 2005 to 2006, Professor Markle served as a historical consultant on pandemic influenza preparedness planning for the US Department of Defense, 
From 2006 to 15, he served as the principal historical consultant on pandemic preparedness for the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine of the CDC, and also served as a member of the CDC director's H1N1 Influenza Team B, a real-time think tank of experts charged with evaluating the federal government and President Obama's influenza policies on a daily basis during and after the outbreak. His historical research has played a vital role in developing the evidence base for many community migration strategies employed by the WHO, the CDC, the Mexican Ministry of Health, numerous state, provincial, and municipal health departments around the globe. He's cited extensively in academic and media outlets, and we're very thankful he's agreed to speak with our audience today. So Howard, why don't you start us off and frame the history of our responses to pandemics? Thank you for that. I'm, I'm delighted to be here and uh, to speak with you all this morning, uh, albeit on an internet uh, format. Um, I'm charged with talking a little bit about the history of social distancing, which of course over time has had many names. If you're a medievalist, you might call it quarantine. Uh, later on, you might call it uh, public gathering bans and uh, uh, more recently it was called non-pharmaceutical interventions and currently either social distancing or uh, there are even other terms that people don't like the term social in there that it's physical distancing. That aside, uh, let's start with the first slide. So uh, back in 2005, when there was an avian influenza outbreak uh, brewing across Asia, H5N1 was the strain, and public health officials were very concerned that this novel uh, flu strain might somehow mutate and become easily transmitted human to human. Fortunately, it was only really a bird problem. Uh, and uh, there were only about 500 human cases of H5N1. And most of those people were uh, butchers or small children who were involved in uh, taking out the feathers of, of chickens for consumption. Nevertheless, what we've always been talking about in the pandemic world, uh, perhaps too much, is the influenza pandemic of 1919, which uh, up until the present day, but it could get, <laughs> it could change, was always heralded as the worst contagious crisis in human history. Uh, from about September 1st, uh, 1918 through April 5th, 1919, in the United States, there were about 10 million, perhaps as many as 15 million uh, cases, and anywhere from 500,000 to 750,000 deaths. Worldwide, there were hundreds of millions of cases and probably more than 50 million flu deaths worldwide. Uh, a lot of those flu deaths, by the way, were consolidated by the patients getting bacterial pneumonia in an era that was before antibiotics, and so they often succumbed to bacterial pneumonia. Well, um, I was getting ready for the uh, July 4th weekend in 2005 when my secretary uh, called my number uh, at about four o'clock that day, it was a Friday, and she said, uh, the Pentagon is on line seven. So I was a bit shocked because uh, the Pentagon is never on lines one through seven in my experience. And indeed it was a, a colonel, a physician there, who represented the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, which was an interesting group that started out of the Cold War. And it was a medical unit that uh, originally was charged with looking at the threat of nuclear war and the post effects of radiation poisoning. But over the years had increased its portfolio to include infectious diseases, naturally occurring uh, disasters, uh, as well as um, uh, pandemics. And so this uh, colonel wanted me to look at uh, seven escape communities and a concept that we actually named, we called it protective sequestration. Because isolation means that you're actually isolating somebody who is uh, diagnosed, confirmed diagnosed with the infectious disease in question. Quarantine uh, is the separation of those you suspect having close physical contact 
with those who are ill. But protective sequestration, which is essentially what we're doing right now, uh, turns the whole idea on its ear because you're protecting those before they ever have contact with the virus or bacteria in question. And there were seven areas, uh, Gunnison, Colorado, and that's where that little postcard on the left is. It was a mining town uh, for the Western Mining Company nestled within the Rocky Mountains, Yerba Buena Island in San Francisco, Princeton University, Bryn Mawr College, the Trudeau TB Sanitarium in Saranac Lake and the Western School for the Blind in Pittsburgh. This is when we essentially quarantined people who we thought were diseased or medicalized as such back then, and Fletcher, Vermont. And what we found in these communities is that as long as they kept their doors closed, stopped their railway systems or roads, stopped schools, public gatherings, etc., there were no cases and no deaths. And as soon as they opened up their, their gates, so to speak, uh, they started to have cases. And that was very interesting to us, although it's not the most practical thing to completely shut yourself off from the outside world. Well, that's when we began to work with the Centers for Disease Control, specifically uh, with the Division of uh, Global Migration and Quarantine. Uh, the director of that then is now is Dr. Martin Citron, and we've been colleagues for many years. And we were very interested in looking not at escape communities that completely shut down, but regular American cities, because they all did something. Uh, but how they did it, what order they did it, uh, uh, that mattered, and we want, or maybe it didn't, and we wanted to see, we wanted to ask those questions with this particular uh, hypothesis in mind. And so this cartoon well, may look familiar to you, but it was the original slide of, of what we now call flattening the curve. You'll see that's a classic epi curve, and we're wondering if we could delay the first case. And then let's press on it again as well as flatten, to decompress the peak burden of uh, people coming to hospitals at the same time. Because that's a really important issue. If everybody is flooding to ERs and hospitals, they'll quickly be inundated. And they have regular you know, heart attacks, diabetes, whatever, whatever to handle as well. So you don't want everybody coming at the same time. And hopefully, if you can buy enough time you would diminish the overall cases and health impacts of that pandemic. Well, the actual term flattening the curve arose uh, well, I was, when I was working on this with the CDC, with Marty Citron, we were, I was in Atlanta almost every other week because it was easier to work with his, all of his epidemiologists and statisticians were there. So we would particularly uh, work late in the evening and we were eating some particularly bad takeout food and I ordered some type of noodle dish. And by the time it came and it all congealed into one giant flat noodle. And so I said, look, it's just like our curve, it's flattened. And so that's at least my version of the story of how that expression came about. But this was the hypothesis of what we wanted to study. Well, the paper that resulted uh, with about 12 historians, I called it the Manhattan Project, of history of medicine and many epidemiologists and statisticians was this paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association in August of 2007. And we took 43 cities that we found that were uh, well documented in one source, the US Census and Mortality uh, Report that looked at each week's cases and deaths from influenza. Uh, the population range from about 100,000 to 5.6 million. It was about 23 million people or a quarter, almost a quarter of the U.S. population. And the results that we found was that it wasn't the same story in every city. If you read some of the popular histories that are much more um, dramatic than they need to be, different cities had different experiences. And we hypothesized and then demonstrated that they had different experiences because they did things in a different way. That red curve is the epi curve for the uh, East Coast cities. Now, they, uh, their, their epidemics began first because it came from overseas and they were the front line and they didn't have as much time to decide what they wanted to do as other uh, cities in the Midwest and the West. That uh, green curve, which has some of the best 
uh, experiences is uh, the Midwest and Southern cities. Now, I wonder if I can make an arrow. I don't know if I can, but if you can see the green uh, epi curve, there's two humps. So think, hold that thought, put a pin in that. And again, you see again with the uh, West Coast cities, which had the most time, but didn't always do a very good job. San Francisco was especially had a tough uh, uh, experience. They too have what I call a double humped curve. What's most interesting to me was that 23 of our, out of our 43 cities had these double humped curves, as you can see, at different points. These are just nine of them. It's a very busy slide, but I wanted you to see this curve. And right at this point in each city, you know, right at the peak of that curve, uh, the natives got restless. They were tired of being cooped up. They were tired of their kids staying home. They were tired of not going to uh, the bars or the bowling alleys or the vaudeville houses. And the cases were indeed coming down, but virus was still circulating. And so when they opened up the gates, as you can see at these various points, they opened up the gates seven days later, because that's the incubation period for influenza, which of course is a different virus altogether from COVID, the cases went back up again. And then when they pulled the brakes back down, the cases went down again, as you can see. So brakes on, cases go down. Brakes off, cases go up, and then they put the brakes back on again. So what was fascinating about these dual peak cities is that NPI, that's uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, the activations were followed by a reduction of deaths. And typically when they were deactivated, death rates increased, highlighting the transient protective nature of such measures and the need for a long, a sustained response. Because all you're doing is hiding from the virus in question. You're not curing it, you're not killing it, you're just hiding. And the specificity of temporal associations between the excess mortality and when the NPI triggers went on and when they went off suggested a causal relationship. Uh, you, you couldn't get much better than that in, in this type of living postmortem study to find that. Actually, that's a contradiction in the terms living and postmortem, but historical study, let's call it that. And none of the 43 cities had a second peak of influenza while the first set of NPIs were still in effect. So in essence, each of those cities with bimodal patterns served as their own control group. And so our Conclusion was that early sustained and layered application of these NPIs, which specifically were quarantine and isolation, school closures, and social distancing, played a critical role in mitigating the consequence of the 1918-19 influenza pandemic in the US as well as elsewhere. If you could show those cartoons just now. And what each layer was, was like a layer of Swiss cheese. They, are, they were all imperfect, they were all had holes in them, they could all be uh, violated, but if you layered more than one layer of Swiss cheese over another, you kind of blocked, you blocked those holes, did the best you could at least. And this became uh, the evidence base for the federal pandemic flu policy, first beginning in February uh, 2007, and then it was re-updated on the right there in 2017. And the study that we did has been uh, reproduced by other historical studies, not only of the United States, but of other areas, by computer modeling studies, and by several studies taking place during the 2009 H1N1 uh, influenza pandemic. And you can see from this epi curve, this is from the Mexican Ministry of Health. You'll notice that this epi curve, uh, this is about the time that they started pulling down the brakes and you see uh, a, re a, a reduction in cases. People got a little bit restless around this point about almost two weeks into it. They let the cases, they let the brakes go off and then they went right back up again and then they put the brakes on again. Now, what's interesting is that at 18 days, that was the length of their uh, response in Mexico, which was, by the way, extremely transparent and helpful with other countries, notably the United States and Canada, in telling them what was going on and sharing virus samples and so on. But they were incredibly helpful. Uh, but at 18 days, we learned that the uh, 
H1N1 uh, flu was not much more lethal than seasonal flu. And because of that, we would only apply these measures, these social distancing measures, in a worst case scenario where the case fatality rate was as bad or greater than influenza in 1918. Back then it was about 2.5%, but in many places as high as 10%. And you may recall uh, the WHO reporting uh, in March that the case fatality rate for COVID-19, particularly among specific groups, such as the elderly, uh, people with certain health conditions, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular problems, and even obesity, was, was about 3.8%. So that's why those triggers went uh, on. Uh, and if you want to look up some of the stuff that we did, we decided to design it. We didn't want to let we, you know, we gathered some 25,000 documents and wrote uh, bi biographies, if you will, of it's now up to 50 cities and their experience uh, in the influenza pandemic of 1918-1919. And you can find all that on influenzaarchive.org. And so I think I will close there. There might be one more slide. Oh, Google even uh, <laughs> memorialized flattening their, the curve in their cartoon for April 6, 2020. So this impressed my high school uh, age daughter, no end. So I thought I would show you that. And, and then I'll close at this point and look forward to uh, Topher's talk and the dialogue that follows. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Professor Markle, for that fascinating presentation. Um, I just want to reiterate that the uh, influenza archive uh, covering all 50 states is really fascinating. Um, since COVID broke out, uh, a number of people have reached out to me asking if I can speak to the 1918 uh, Spanish flu pandemic. And that has sort of been my first port of call, so to speak. Uh, the, the Influenza Archive has been my first port of call um, for sort of gathering information so that I can uh, speak to, to that particular episode in history. Um, I also want to thank uh, Professor Cagney, Mark, and Francis, and the other organizers for inviting me to participate in this particular conversation. Um, Today, I'm going to provide a very brief overview of my research interests and then highlight but one very small sliver of my current book project as it relates to the concept of social distancing uh, more broadly. So between the first voyages of Captain Cook in the late 1760s and the advent of Trans-Pacific Aviation in 1936, Colonization, trade, and migration accelerated the spread of infectious diseases around the Pacific. What was once deemed a largely uncontaminated region of the globe soon mutated into a uh, theater of public health catastrophes, from the depopulation of indigenous peoples uh, and outbreaks aboard migrant vessels to epidemics in developing port cities. In response to these biological crises, an informal nexus of public health officials across the Pacific Basin uh, began to coalesce by the mid-19th century. Their chief objective was to curb the transmission of disease by deciphering who was at risk of infection and who or what uh, was likely to convey it. My current research focuses on Honolulu, Hawaii, the mid-Pacific linchpin of this public health network. Um, I examine how public health officials harnessed the police powers of the state to transform Honolulu, uh, as Professor Cagney had mentioned, from a uh, passive harbor into a disease screening checkpoint for the Hawaiian Islands, the Pacific Basin, and America's growing overseas empire. It was the advent of steamships that fully integrated Hawaii into an already thriving Pacific world. Uh, this ultimately rendered Honolulu a catalyst for the circulation of disease. So microbial hitchhikers from abroad uh, often appeared in Honolulu before resurfacing elsewhere in Hawaii or other Pacific seaports. While disproportionately plaguing the city's native Hawaiian and East Asian migrant communities, these epidemic connections also threatened the security of inter-island trade 
among the Hawaiian Islands, Trans-Pacific mobility, and America's imperial influence within and beyond the Pacific Ocean. So during this period, I argued that Honolulu assumed a unique and often self-proclaimed responsibility as a, quote, sanitary sieve, um, an urban clearinghouse that could filter out diseases traversing the Pacific. So originating in the 1850s, uh, this development ultimately bolstered Honolulu's eventual evolution into a lucrative way station for Trans-Pacific vessels, uh, an agricultural entrepot for sugar plantations, and a naval rendezvous for the United States. Local and federal health officials engineered this municipal project in a number of ways, uh, but one of the most elaborate and contested methods was through the implementation of stringent quarantine laws and the creation of quarantine and isolation facilities. So for the remainder of my talk, um, I just want to talk about one very minute uh, sort of moment in history and the development of these quarantine measures and these quarantine facilities. So in 1853, there was a massive smallpox epidemic. Case, uh, historical reports claim that the disease arrived in Honolulu from Gold Rush, California. Uh, for the better part of a year, smallpox hopped from Honolulu to the rest of uh, the island of Oahu to the outer islands of the Hawaiian archipelago, killing somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000 native Hawaiians. Uh, the numbers are uh, questionable uh, at best uh, because records are more efficient in Honolulu than they are in the rural regions of the Hawaiian islands. But uh, various estimates place it between 6,000 and 10,000 Native Hawaiians. In 15 years later, in 1868, there was a second smallpox scare. Uh, the disease had resurfaced in San Francisco, and in uh, San Francisco, it ultimately uh, resulted in the Golden State's deadliest urban epidemic of the 19th century. Uh, such developments sparked concern among health officials in Hawaii, uh, not only because of the devastating epidemic from 15 years prior in 1853, but also because the first official steamship line between Hawaii and California had been established at the same time San Francisco's smallpox epidemic of 1868 was emerging. So with a permanent steamship line in place, direct communication between San Francisco and Honolulu was now more frequent, much faster, and more reliable than ever before. What was once deemed a harbinger of Hawaii's future prosperity was quickly devolving into a potential public health and commercial liability. So as the 19th century progressed, uh, developments such as these uh, prompted health officials in Honolulu, in Honolulu to implement quarantine laws that were often modeled on similar regulations emerging in seaports across the Western world. In Hawaii, quarantine laws disproportionately affected two different groups of people. Uh, the first were steamship passengers, of course, um, these typically, the vast majority of these were typically Chinese or Japanese migrants uh, who were coming to Hawaii to work on sugar plantations or rice plantations. Um, typically Chinese or Japanese migrants who showed signs of infection during their inbound trans-Pacific journeys. Once they arrived in Honolulu, they would be examined by a medical physician. And if any cases on board of the vessel had appeared during the trip, uh, that individual or individuals plus the rest of the passengers and the crew would be placed into a 14-day quarantine. Uh, sometimes less depending on the disease in question, sometimes more uh, if uh, they couldn't quite determine what disease they were examining or, or uh, what disease they should be protecting against. The second group uh, of people who were disproportionately affected by these quarantine laws were Native Hawaiian urbanites who at various points contracted infectious diseases while on shore in Honolulu and the surrounding hinterlands. So the implementation of quarantine laws also necessitated the creation of 
quarantine and isolation facilities. Um, if you look at the left hand side of each of these three maps on the screen, you can see the gradual creation of a man-made island in Honolulu Harbor. Today it's known as Sand Island. It's connected to the island of Oahu um, through a, uh, a road that was constructed uh, in the mid 20th century. Um, and it's now used as a water treatment facility. But between the mid 19th century and the mid 20th century, uh, this less than a square mile plot of land was known as Quarantine Island. So the Hawaiian government created this island by dredging the seafloor in Honolulu Harbor. Uh, the purpose behind dredging the seafloor was to accommodate steamships that were progressively getting deeper and wider as the 19th century progressed. But when you do that sort of, um, when you embark on that sort of infrastructural project, you have to have a place to dump the material that you pull up from the ground. And so that material uh, that they accumulated was then dumped onto a natural reef on the west side of the harbor. And so that is how Quarantine Island uh, came to be. It is how it got bigger over the course of the 19th century. So Honolulu and the Hawaiian Islands may have been a tropical getaway for wealthy globetrotters at the time, uh, but for those forced onto Quarantine Island, their stay was, as I think, as I think many of us assume, uh, less than enjoyable. Um, so if you look at the top left image of this particular slide, uh, this is a fumigation and disinfection building. So depending on the size of the vessel that would come into Honolulu, it would uh, be transported into this particular facility um, and it would be fumigated and disinfected. Uh, mail bags and luggage and, uh, and passengers would be offloaded at this particular site um, and they would be disinfected or the, the mail bags and the, and the vessels and the bag, baggage would be disinfected. Um, the individuals, the passengers, would be transported from this building to Quarantine Island. So if you look in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, you'll see a tramway or a pier. Um, so from the photographer's perspective, that is where the disinfection plant is, and individuals would, would walk along this pier to the buildings in the distance, um, which is where Quarantine Island was. The top right hand corner is just a visual representation of this, but from the other perspective, so you can actually see uh, Japanese migrants uh, walking from the disinfection plant in the far distance towards Quarantine Island. And then in the bottom right hand corner, uh, you can see the actual facilities themselves. Uh, this is just one building. There are, by the, by the early 20th century, two or three buildings. Um, and they're just small rooms that have uh, boards attached to the wall that would get pulled down and it would provide a sleeping space for quarantined individuals. So in many ways, Hawaiian uh, quarantine laws and the creation of Quarantine Island uh, were developments that were by no means unique to Honolulu. Facilities like these emerged within and beyond the Pacific throughout the 19th century, including, for example, North Head in Sydney, Australia, and Angel Island in San Francisco, California. Um, however, for public health officials in Honolulu, Quarantine Island uh, often served as the entire Hawaiian archipelago's first line of defense against the, quote, foreign introduction of infectious diseases. Uh, as you can see from the map, uh, Honolulu uh, is exceptionally connected to the rest of the Pacific world. And each of these connections is once again connected to other parts of the globe. And so for Honolulu, uh, Quarantine Island, this less than a square mile space, was essential to uh, the prosperity of Honolulu and, and the greater Hawaiian archipelago. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to end there, uh, but I'm happy to elaborate on any part of this presentation or any part of the larger book project as the webinar progresses. Thank you. Thank you, Topher and Howard for giving us sort of the global to local perspectives um, 
you know, thinking about what we might apply, right, in these different sorts of contexts. And Howard, I'm going to ask you if, if you could you know, comment briefly on this notion of a quarantine island. I like the idea of this urban clearinghouse and wondered if you could kind of um, draw out Topher's comments and frame them in the context of your own work. Well, in fact, um, almost every major uh, seaport city mm -hmm. had quarantine islands or lazarettos, uh, beginning with Venice, where the term quarantine was first coined in about 1470 in response to the Black Plague. And uh, uh, it meant quarante giorno or 40 days. And that island is still there. I've actually been on it. Uh, but you would find, particularly in the American situation or the European situation, uh, along their coasts, uh, 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 lazarettos or quarantine islands where people coming in would have to pass inspections for specific diseases. And these uh, quarantine islands existed long before microbes were thought to be the actual etiologic uh, cause of these diseases, but they still knew enough that they didn't want those people in air quotes uh, near our people and they kept them uh, isolated. These were clearinghouse is a good word because there was really no medical treatment in the finest of facilities back then, but particularly for immigrants that were uh, not exactly popular uh, coming into a country, uh, they basically just waited for them to either catch the disease if they were quarantined or if they were isolated, battle the disease and die or live. By the way, you could even catch a disease if you were in quarantine and were bunking down next to somebody who was ill. So um, in my own work, um, uh, when I studied New York City's uh, quarantine facilities, uh, which were state run, and they were not the Ellis Island uh, facility, which was nationally run, uh, you would also find them in Boston, Philadelphia, Angel Island, as Topher mentioned, in San Francisco. But, you know, in places like Hamburg or La Havre or, you know, ver variety of, of, of ports. And then the various notion was especially uh, targeted at immigrants traveling in the steerage uh, compartments of these ships. This was, mm, yeah. you know, bargain traveling. This was uh, the jet blue of its day. Uh, it was, <laughs> it, they were, but <laughs> I don't know which is worse, but at least jet blue is shorter. But, um, you know, you were, you were in the bottom of these boats for, you know, right. days to weeks, particularly the Pacific crossings could be, you know, anywhere from 12 to 14 days in the European crossings, the Atlantic crossings were about seven to 10. And, you know, it was, it was awful. There was a central trough for water. You sometimes had to bring your own food. There were not bathroom facilities per se, there were buckets. So they were perfect, uh, you know, hives of sickness, if you will. And at the time, because people thought that certain diseases were only associated with, quote, dirty immigrants, end quote, um, the first class passengers might not be nearly as closely scrutinized uh, and were much more quickly passed through to wherever mm -hmm. they were going, the destination point. So there was a great amount of association of, quote, dirty immigrants with diseases. And uh, the, uh, the powers of the quarantine officer were quite immense and were terribly frightening, even for those who passed. And there, there, are, there is record after record or oral history after oral history of people, even those people who are going through Ellis Island, which was primarily to see if you had a bond that you would not cost the country all that much money, fewer than, oh, far fewer than 1% were ever sent back at Ellis Island because mm -hmm. of a contagious disease. Yet if you talk to immigrants who went through that uh, giant great hall, they were all terrified of being mm -hmm. sent back. So the, the perceptual uh, image of what was going on was quite, quite great. So uh, is that, does that answer your question? That was uh, yeah, perfect. And I had not realized that that percentage was so low because the yeah. narrative, right, right. suggests, right, that it was more right. threatening, that it was higher. Right. So that's helpful to situate. Right. You know, 75 percent of the immigration through uh, uh, 1880 through 1924, which is a, the great wave of immigration until the gates are closed with the Immigration Restriction Act, 75 percent came through Ellis Island. But before they went to Ellis Island, they were inspected by state officers at Swinburne and Hoffman Islands, which are right under the Narrows-Verrazano Bridge. The uh, uh, Ellis Island check uh, 
uh, they didn't check for quarantinable diseases like smallpox, which is one of the great mm -hmm. errors in Godfather 2, which is a perfect movie. Mm -hmm. Other than that, Vito, <laughs> young Vito Corleone is quarantined on Ellis Island for right. smallpox. He would have been on Swinburne Island, but they didn't ask me. But anyway, uh, uh, but everybody was worried about trachoma, for example, and you would be checked, mm -hmm. you know, you've seen those pictures. And, uh, but again, it was far fewer than 1%, but, but the popular perception was quite different. Tofren, I would have, you wanted to comment on that too, this kind of component of social class. It's, it's really uh, you know, such an important element of who is living and dying right now, at least in the US co context. We mentioned that 100K point earlier today. Social class matters in terms of resources and in terms of risk. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in Hawaii and elsewhere around the Pacific and elsewhere across the globe, um, there are multiple instances of uh, first class or second class cabin passengers uh, sort of arriving in, uh, arriving in the port and uh, being on a vessel that has cases of smallpox or measles or other infectious diseases. And in my own research, I know that there's a, a few cases where people just pay the quarantine officer or pay the port physician to get through. Mm -hmm. so they, are wealthy and they're well connected. Um, they're often white. And so they get through these barriers that are often placed on others. Uh, just to, to refer to something that Howard had mentioned about the sort of popular perception of quarantine, this perception was so, um, so strong and so widespread that there are cases of uh, Chinese immigrants, for example, arriving in Honolulu in the 1880s uh, aboard vessels that are carrying 600, 700 Chinese mm -hmm. immigrants. Mm -hmm. And because there's so many immigrants, Quarantine Island itself is not large enough to hold all of them. So they keep them on this vessel after they've already traveled for 8, 9, 10, 14 days across the Pacific. And as they're being placed in quarantine, that quarantine time period gets longer and longer on these vessels mm -hmm. as new people get the disease on that vessel over time. Mm -hmm. And there are cases of Chinese immigrants sort of rebelling against quarantine and sort of jumping overboard and attempting to swim across the harbor to get on land uh, oh. because they have no idea how long they're actually going to be in quarantine or how long they're going to be isolated on these vessels. Um, but those are perceptions that they, or and realities, uh, that they learn about before they even get on the boat in Hong Kong or in Yokohama uh, on their way to the Hawaiian Islands. Great. That was a really interesting example, right, of how those distinctions really cause people, right, to engage in pretty desperate activities. Um, Howard, your comment about Godfather II <laughs> made me think about how we draw on history when we're making decisions, and that led me to think about policy. And I'd, I'd love comments from the both of you about how contemporary policymakers are drawing from lessons of the past or not, and even drawing from lessons in contemporary space um, in terms of how other nations, I'm using the US as an example, where else could we look? We are right in spirit in Hong Kong today and what might we have learned and what can we still learn from what other nations are doing? So I'm, so I'm asking you to both reflect on the past and the present, but, but really thinking about all the ways we could secure information to make potentially better choices. Well, having been, um the lone historian in the room where policy was being made. Yes. I was always felt like an umpire <laughs> more <laughs> than a participant. And I, I would always be saying, well, you know, history, you know, there's, there's that, that trope, you know, George Santayana may have uh, coined it, but those who ignore the past are destined to repeat it. It's a very popular trope and, and historians are always saying, well, you know, it doesn't exactly repeat itself. Uh, uh -huh. History travels in, you know, cycles, not circles or whatever, you know, and, uh, but, but there's a great um, belief, particularly in places like Washington, uh, that if the historian is there, uh, he or she is an oracle uh, because uh -huh. A happened in 1900, B will happen in 2020. So you have to be very careful about that and talking about context, which is the, the exact opposite of what 
the far more influential scholars, the modelers, the mathematical modelers in the room are embraced and, and, and fed it because everybody loves numbers. You love numbers far more than you love history stories. And whether they're right or wrong is inconsequential really. And of course these models are, you know, the models are great, but they are models and they're only as good as the questions being asked. And, uh, you know, so historians always say, well, no, it matters about what contextually is going on. So when Topher is studying his work, you know, the, you know, particularly after 1890 with the Gary Act and the Chinese Exclusion Act, which mm -hmm. makes Chinese immigration far mm -hmm. smaller than uh, European immigration, for example, mm -hmm. and far more scrutinized because of the, the yellow peril and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it was, the, 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 the discrimination was uh, beyond overt. It was very loud and amplified. Um, so uh, you try to guide uh, policymakers uh, with the best evidence you can. Uh, flu is very popular, even though, as I said, it's not the same virus and they, they're, they're mm -hmm. transmitted in similar ways, but they're very different. And the RNA containing virus of Corona makes it very crafty, particularly this strain, which is quite bad. And uh, so you try to, you know, give your best possible information, but 1918 was so helpful for social distancing because it's the greatest example of all these age old mm -hmm. methods in the postmodern germ theory era. Even though in 1918, doctors did not understand virology at all, let alone mm -hmm. the, the virologic cause of flu. They thought it was a bacteria called the Haemophilus influenzae, but at least you get a lot of numbers of people. Uh, but it's not, you know, what's great about this work has been, it's been reproducible. Mm -hmm. uh, when it's been done by other historians, when it's done by other modelers, when it's done in real life, it's been reproducible. And to a scientist, social scientist, as well as a natural scientist, reproducibility is all. It, it's not good science if it can't be repeated, which is very different from history where we revise and revise and tell our own version of it. So at the doctor side of me, uh, was mm -hmm. screaming much more loudly, hooray, than the historian side of my brain, because it was very gratifying, even though this is horrific, a horrific situation, but it's been really gratifying to see that uh, it's, it does appear to be working again and again in terms of flattening the curve. Topher, what are your thoughts? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I gave a lecture on a similar topic, and the first question that came up was, if you were in, if Governor Pritzker invited, of, of Illinois invited you into a conversation about uh, COVID-19, what would you say? And my response was, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> um, because, <laughs> Good to be polite. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but I think part of it is that as Howard said, he was often the only historian in the room. Um, it, I have not yet had the experience of, of working with uh, people outside of academia on topics like this, um, but the number of times I've watched the news or uh, I've read a newspaper or whatnot, and you're like, you're sitting there, you're reading it, and you're like, you, there, in some cases, you could just replace COVID-19 with another disease name and come up with a similar-ish type of story. Um, I, I wish more historians were in the room for those conversations to provide insight, um, whether or not that happens uh, to a greater extent uh, is something we'll wait and see. But it, and in some sense, it, it is happening more than it has. Oh, and sure. so, you know, the, the National Academy of Medicine, for example, which is a pretty august institution, they, when they had social distancing uh, discussions, you know, similar to this, uh, historians were invited. Um, and uh, at various times during the whole flu wars from 2005 to about 2010, mm -hmm. there were a few historians, not necessarily the right ones, by the way, either. Sometimes there are popular best-selling historians who, you know, I might argue don't have the rigor uh, that, uh, you know, others might have. And it's particularly difficult with late 19th, early 20th century history of medicine. I mean, I'm using history of health, public mm -hmm. health, mm -hmm. 
uh, just shorthand, but because the terms are the same, but the meanings are different. So the word vaccine will appear many times, or even the term virus, and mean very different things. And so that nuance is really, really important. I, 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 call, I had the experience a few weeks ago when Governor Whitmer of my state, Michigan, mm -hmm. was using graphs from my paper, one of my papers, right. only was blown up. And so I called my friend who works for her and I said, hey, <laughs> he didn't give me credit. <laughs> and he said, be happy that we use the, be happy that we use the graph. And so sometimes you have to take your victories as they come. Yeah, and it's, yeah. And it's good to share, right? So at least it's people good to share, right? are drawing on the work and that's what's fundamental. So, so that reminds me a bit of normative orientations toward uh, responses in a pandemic context. And one of the things that, that we've really seen the last few weeks, at least in the United States, is, is um, the mass becoming a political symbol. And it, it seems like the take up of, of mask wearing in other parts of the world, particularly in Asia, much more normative the expectation is that one would protect oneself. And I'm, so I'm wondering from a historical perspective why we saw and why we are seeing the mask elevated in that way. Um, and wonder if you can help us frame that. Well, in many ways, the mask are one of the iconic symbols of mm -hmm. modern medicine, mm -hmm. albeit in the operating theater. Um, but there's a real uh, romance, if you will, with the mask, uh, as we've seen people, you know, dashing actors on TV wearing them and 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 protecting themselves and others, um, there were mask laws in different parts of the country, United okay. States, during the 1918 pandemic. San Francisco, in particular, decided to use mask laws uh, in it more so than social distancing measures. Mm -hmm. And wearing masks, if you've worn them for a long period of time, is a pain in the neck. It's not yeah. fun. And particularly if you're wearing an N95 mask and you're rebreathing your air over and over again, it can make you feel a little bit weird. Mm -hmm. And it's hard having things over your ears. And also a lot of masks, particularly today, but especially back then, were made out of cloth or, or, or mm -hmm. fabrics, even of paper-based fabrics, where you breathe in holes, microscopic holes after a period that are big enough for a virus to come in. Having said that, Wearing a mask, particularly if you're a health responder, uh, it allows some protection, some barrier, and it probably does the same, but not, you know, not completely uh, at home. Uh, that doesn't mean you're completely protected, and you might get the false sense of protection by uh -huh. wearing it. Um, so we are seeing it a lot more, although now, at least in my home state, we're seeing people walk out without them. And uh, it, it, that does uh, 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 concern me. I even have slides, I didn't show you them, but during the 2009 pandemic, of a guy smoking a cigarette, there's a little hole in his mask and he's smoking his cigarette, <laughs> you know, and stuff like that. So people, people may wear a mask, but they may not necessarily wear it correctly or it's on at their angle or the side. I have a great photograph. Yeah, I have a photograph of the mayor of, of uh, San Francisco, only it's a Xerox of a Xerox with his mask dangling from mm -hmm. his neck in 1918. So uh, proper wearing of the mask is, is every bit as important as wearing the mask and wearing a, a proper mask is also important too. We're actually nearing um, the end of our conversation today, but I, I did want to close uh, with a very nice question from a listener who asks, what lessons can we learn from quarantine practices over the centuries? And, and what the economic impact of those quarantine practices um, has been? And I thought that was a really uh, nice way to sort of bring much of what you have described as both um, sort of globally and in the US context. Um, how, do we, how do we situate that? And I like that economic hook. Topher, do you wanna start us off? Sure. I think recently, I can't remember the author's name, but there was an article that came out about non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, as they related to the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. Um, <clears throat> and it came out a couple of days uh, after President Trump initially announced uh, that he wanted to reopen the economy by Easter, uh, which 
obviously has not happened. But uh, the main purpose of the article was to demonstrate about, by looking at, I think, 50 cities across the United States, um, how these cities bounced back mm -hmm. uh, after the pandemic, uh, depending on when non-pharmaceutical interventions were imposed and how stringent they were. And the information that they came up with, or the conclusions that they drew from that was, the earlier NPIs are implemented and the stricter those NPIs are, the faster that city will bounce back once the economy begins to reopen. Uh, so cities uh, like, uh, I think Seattle and Portland, Oregon, bounced back much quicker than other cities like Philadelphia or Pittsburgh um, because yeah they implemented these uh, NPIs much earlier and for a longer period of time than, than these other cities. Yeah, that was a Federal Reserve uh, Bank of New York study and they actually used uh, our data collected at yes. the <laughs> UM and, uh, CDC, so I know it well. And it makes sense. Um, and there was a recent study by Columbia University that was widely covered on the front page of New York Times last week that the earlier you do these methods, how many lives you could save. And so for all the complaints that we're getting or the protest, I feel very justified, both as a physician and a historian of medicine, that this is a process that can and does save lives. Um, and it does make sense that the economy would bounce back quicker, particularly then in 1918, when it was a very gender-based economy. And it was males who were the quote breadwinners and women were, were you know, homemakers and such, so that if the men died, uh, uh, widowed uh, uh, mothers who had, you know, families were really up the creek in terms of how would they pay their rent or what have you. Um, it also makes sense that the fewer deaths you have and the fewer disruptions you have once the uh, epidemic is over, that you can recoup your losses. Um, you know, We've been having epidemics and pandemics since at least the time of Adam and Eve. They've been with us forever. And with each iteration, humankind has moved on and progressed, or at least, uh, at least uh, went on <laughs> with their lives, sometimes too blithely and leaving very uh -huh. frequently the, the same conditions that uh, cause those problems in the first place. I call that the, the end of an epidemic is a global amnesia. And so I would like to take the opposite view, not what history can teach us, but what this pandemic can teach us. If it does not teach us to be on guard all the time, to have international uh, uh, working relationships of surveillance, reporting, viral samples, uh, no right. concealment whatsoever or delay in reporting what's going on and when, and working together from you know, the leaders all the way down to regular citizens. If this does not teach us the import of that, I don't know what will. Well, those are certainly words to live by. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> really. <laughs> and yeah. yeah, and words to close with today. Uh, and uh, what a terrific conversation, Christopher Kindle, Howard Markle. Thank you so much for your time, for helping us frame social distancing and pandemics more broadly. And I'm Confident you two are open to queries from our listeners um, after we close today. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. And good day. <laughs>